So uh, this is a fun talk, a lighthearted talk about when not to use maps. So uh, there are obviously some fantastic maps and some, some amazing things that can be done with maps. And um, the first example that I want to show is this map. This was hand drawn by one guy over the course of about two years, seven days a week, uh, a guy named Dave Imus. And it's, um, this map has received uh, a ton of attention lately, uh, won a Cartographic Society Best in Show Award, and it has been, it has been praised for its excellent design choices, um, for its, its uh, attention to detail, for the exquisite representation of geography, for um, uh, really appropriate choices in terms of labeling and what level of detail to include. This is a really, a really fantastic map and a really sort of pinnacle example uh, of what can be done. It's totally worth checking out. Um, if you're at all interested in like really excellent cartography. So this is, this is the one end of the spectrum of what's possible. There are some other maps that are not quite so exquisite. So uh, can we have the video, please? So this is the history of uh, Western dance music, and it starts off pretty well. Um, we'll come back to talk about the geography in just a moment. Um, but what happens is, is by the end of this map, we're left with something that's not very useful. I just want to uh, point out one detail here. If we can rewind back to about 1970, it's all good until disco comes along. <laughs> and then, and then after that, it's kind of a mess. So, uh, yeah, some maps not quite so perfect. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about with this map in particular. First of all, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see with the lighting here, but what you have is a situation where you've got Miami is north of New Orleans and Memphis. You have uh, Detroit to the west of Chicago. Um, Germany is north of London and Belgium. There's a, there's a few geographical problems with it, but that's, that's not really, really the worst part. Uh, the worst part here is trying to show this data that has a geographic component on a sort of a map. And my assertion here is that a map is not the best way to represent this data. And in fact, that by putting this data, attempting to plot this data on a map, we've inhibited our ability to understand what's going on here. Um, because what, what you have is you have a lot of spatial representation. You've got arrows that are going everywhere. And we get lost more in the spatialness of it, in the arrows going in all different directions. Uh, and we have then inhibited the ability of, of us as a reader to actually see what the correlations are, to see what the relationships among these different musical genres is. Uh, and I think there's better ways. So I've come up with a couple of questions, I think, that, that as designers we can ask ourselves uh, about maps and about the data that we have to see if this kind of a, a, a map, whether it's geographical or, or more sort of conceptual, is the right answer. The questions are, is location information meaningful? Which is a question I think we don't ask ourselves all the time. Is location the most important relationship? And finally, how relevant is the geographic detail? So we're going to take a look at some examples that uh, address these questions. So the first one, is location information meaningful? On this map, I'm going to say it's not the most important thing. Now, the goal of, of the designer was to show that there's been all sorts of global influence in the music. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate goal. And I think it's a good thing uh, worth representing. I don't think a map was the best way to do it. So this is a very famous. Um, uh, drawing of, of musical genres and the evolution and influence of different musical genres and different bands. And uh, this, is, this traces sort of the early history of, of rock and roll and pop music. And uh, it's a little difficult to see in the details here, but all those red labels are showing different genres that are sort of splitting out of, of the mainstream of, of rock and roll and pop music. And there's a ton of detail here. You can see across the bottom there's a timeline. And this has a couple of advantages. One is that you can, uh, you can actually read it. Um, the second is by having this be a static image rather than a film, you can compare and look at the state of things, for example, in 1960 and 1970 very easily without having to drag the slider back and forth and try to remember the state of things in the before and after. I think you could very easily uh, do a flow map very much like this for, for the previous example and, uh, and just have regional bands, for example, if you want to show influences from North America, from the Caribbean, from India, from Europe, that sort of thing. Here's another couple of maps. Uh, again, the question we're addressing here is, is geography really relevant? These are maps, I think, where geography absolutely is relevant. And the point of these maps is to show some relationships in the geography. Now, the first map on the left with the red and the blue lines, that's a map showing uh, the red lines is showing, um, I forget which is which, 
the blue lines are showing religious divides in Europe, the red lines are showing uh, linguistic divides. So they're showing correlations between Slavic languages, Romance languages, and Germanic languages, and the correlation between that and um, uh, the different Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant regions in Europe. So that one where geography is absolutely what we're talking about, where these regions absolutely have correlations, uh, it's very important to show the geography there. Having this in the list would not be nearly as interesting and useful. The second map, the one on the right that's unlabeled, uh, you'll notice is very similar to the map on the left. There's sort of the, uh, the whole Spain, France, Italy region there. You've got the northern area with Scandinavia, and then things are sort of a little mixed up in the middle. Uh, any guesses on what that map is on the right? That map is the map of wine, beer, and hard liquor in Europe. <laughs> and in fact, there does appear to be some correlation with the religious and linguistic map. Uh, you might say those come as a bundle. So again, these are situations where the geography absolutely is important, and I think this is a totally legitimate and appropriate use of maps. Next question, is location the most important relationship? And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes when you've got geodata, the answer is no. <clears throat> This is a, a little excerpt from a piece that was in the New York Times. It's a map of um, various massacres and, and, and genocides throughout history. And there's a ton of information represented here. This is a visualization I really like because of the level of attention they have put into showing all those different kinds of data. So uh, the size of the bubble shows how many people were killed. There's obviously a horizontal timeline showing what period in history this takes place. The, the horizontal uh, equator lines that split these circles show the duration of that particular event. Um, there are major bands showing deaths from international wars, institutional oppression. There are several of these that are not shown. So they're showing sort of what type of genocide or what was the institution that caused this. And there's geography in here as well, the color of the circles. Now, you could have plotted this on a standard map, and what happens there by using your x and y dimensions to show the geography is you would lose the ability to use those dimensions to talk about other things that are interesting. In this case, they wanted to represent how these, uh, how these were in history. So you've got the horizontal axis as a timeline. You've got some nice categorical groupings on the vertical axis. They can show those, those uh, stripes to, to represent the duration of each event. There's a lot of information that is made available by using those two dimensions that would not be available if we were to plot these on a map. And so while the geography was important here, it was not the most important factor, and I think it was a good choice to not plot these on a map. Here's another example. This is a representation of information that I believe would be impossible to actually show on a real map. Uh, in this sort of a Venn diagram, it's actually an Euler diagram, but in this sort of a way. You couldn't draw all these circles overlapping and non-overlapping with the right countries if you were to stick with geography. So this is an informational representation that foregoes geography altogether, and I think rightfully so, because it's showing groupings uh, in a useful way that does not adhere strictly to the geography that it represents. Um, there's some things that could be done better. I would like to see country labels because I don't know what all these flags are, for example. But in general, when we're showing these logical groupings that are not geographical, removing this from a map was absolutely the right choice. So these are situations where geography was not the most important factor, even though there's some geographical content available. Finally, the last question. How relevant is the geographic detail in the data set that we have? Sometimes you want a lot of it. Sometimes you don't need so much. So this is a very famous map. We've all seen this. Uh, this, is, this is Napoleon marching from Paris to Moscow. Um, there's almost no geography here. There's a couple of rivers, which are very important, uh, because Napoleon's men freeze and drown. Uh, there's the cities where he starts and ends. And there's almost nothing else in the geography here at all. Now, you could have built this map with a very uh, high level of geographic detail, but most of it's irrelevant, so it was left out. And what that leaving detail out does is it allows us to focus on the specific message that we want to convey. It allows us to focus on the data that's not the geography. I think that was an excellent choice on the part of this map. Here's another one. This, is, uh, this got a lot of attention, <clears throat> excuse me, just in the last week. This is Fernando Viega and Martin Wattenberg. Uh, and if you look at this live online, these, this, this is a map of wind, and it's live. It's actually moving. It's really beautiful. You should all just go and like, put this on your projector and, and, and meditate on it for a while. Um, there's, there's no geography here, right? There's an outline. This is basically a United States-shaped window with which to look at the map. And there's a few landmarks represented. But we're not actually talking about the land at all. We're talking about the wind. Obviously, the land influences the wind. But um, it's a really beautiful representation. It's really nice and, again, allows you to focus on what this is about, which is to say the wind and not so much on the underlying geography. Finally, one more example. This is uh, an abstracted, somewhat, representation of the Columbia River estuary system. 
and it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of river. There's, there's many rivers that feed into it. And again, we've abstracted largely away from, from uh, real representational geography. There's, you can see there are Oregon and Washington and British Columbia up above. You can see some Montana and Idaho. Uh, but the states are, are, are merely suggestions, right? Um, really, the focus here is on the network of the rivers. And, and all accuracy has been foregone in terms of, for example, the paths of the rivers. They've all been abstracted straight lines. The Columbia River is not nearly that straight. Uh, but the conversation here is about what is the connection, what is the interconnectedness of these rivers um, and this river system. And so to represent that, abstracting away from the geographical accuracy in terms of a more uh, logistical representation, I think is, is a victory, and this was very well done. So next time you've got a beautiful data set and it's got some geo data or it's got some location data and your first thought is, we're just gonna dump that into a map, stop and think about these questions. Is the location information actually meaningful? Is that what we're here to have a conversation about? And even if the location is meaningful, is it the most important relationship or is there maybe some other aspects of the data that you can represent uh, more valuably than, than putting on a map? Finally, if you decide that you're gonna map it, does it have to be an exact accurate geographical map with a ton of detail, or can it be abstracted in some way where you can represent what you need to represent and not have the map itself, not have the geography or, or the political boundaries on the map itself get in the way of, of the data that you really care about and want to represent. Those are my thoughts. Those are my questions. Let me know how it goes. Thanks very much.